Just like working out requires you to tear muscles at times to make them stronger, breaking your spirit sometimes strengthens it and makes it more resilient. Breaking your heart might actually increase your capacity to love. I want to push myself to the max. I'm going to go after Mount Everest, even though I know that there's dead frozen bodies that basically populate the side of that mountain at the top. And no one will ever see the world like we do as individuals ever again or has ever seen it that way in the past either. Are we living in a simulation? I believe the answer is yes, unequivocally yes. My mind will just blow up right now. A simulation that actually leveraged all of my abilities wouldn't be very fun. A lot of people that sit here and say to me, oh, I think communism's the answer. It never got a real shot. I'm like, dude, go back and look at the entire 20th century. What are you talking about? Thus decreasing their ability to empathize with others and making Thanksgiving dinner a, a, hell, a hell night. It's kind of like, you know, the fall of Rome, where it's like the emperor comes out and says, oh, we're going to issue games, you know, for everyone and we'll give them bread and wine at the games. It's like the craziest stuff ever right now. I think one of the most important things is to teach our youth to start seeing the world from outside of their own shoes. The Avenue of the Strongest is a podcast dedicated to exploring the lives and experiences of the most inspiring individuals from around the world. Each episode features interviews with fascinating guests who share their insights and wisdom on a variety of topics, including education, impact, motivation, health, and learning. Here are your hosts, Aniette Chowdhury and Vlad Suleiman. Over the last year, 86.6% of our regular viewers have not yet hit the subscription button. Your subscription means a lot to us. It's a small gesture on your end and a huge leap forward for our channel. If you wouldn't mind, we would love to ask you if you found our channel informative and engaging, if you can please hit that subscription button. Your subscription means a lot to us. It allows us to go ahead and continue to put out great content, better guests, and as always, we will always put out two episodes per week. Thank you so much. Are we living in a simulation? <laughs> okay. Now, I was wondering when you were going to finally ask me that. I, I was I was planning to ask, but yeah, let's get let's get into that because that's that is my natural next question. I believe the answer is yes, unequivocally yes. And can you clarify for for for, for our audience out there, so if yes, what does it mean? What what does that mean? What, what is a simulation? What does that look like? Well, first of all, what is the definition? What's the definition of a matrix? It's it's always a mathematical construct, right? right. It's a matrix. It's like a scaffolding, and that matrix of the universe, the only thing that we have denied that has led us to believing in this falsehood that we call materialism um, is that we have failed to objectively analyze what is space. Is space really empty? If light doesn't travel because it's really just traveling just like all other wave phenomenon as a wave perturbation of energy that's passing through mm -hmm. a medium, then there must also be some medium within the vacuum. And this is right. what it deposited all the way through the 19th century and early 20th century, this notion of an ether, a luminiferous ether. This is what Nikola Tesla believed as well. And when you start digging deeper into this, you start realizing that what we thought was material is actually mental. So what do I mean by that? Well, the latest Nobel Prize that was just given was awarded for quantum entanglement. Okay. And it proved local realism is false. So in other words, if no one's actually observing something, you could surmise that whatever that thing is no longer holds a position and actually sits as a wave function. So until you observe it, which then the moment you observe something, it snaps into what we would call in term a wave collapse into a particle. Mm -hmm. So you could think of this just like one over X in their number series. So you've got one over X, which creates a sine cosine wave, especially for prime numbers. 
and they've got these long periods of repetition. It literally creates a, mm -hmm. a wave of expression that's infinite. And we're in wow. a cycle of repetition mm -hmm. of that yeah. repetition cycle until we finally wake up to the fact that we are actually in a simulation. I'm, I'm curious about your thoughts on how math can contribute to happiness because right now, you know, the more I, the more I know I know, the more I understand that how miserably small I know. <laughs> so Yeah, and, yeah, and that's makes... my favorite thing. Is like the more I learn, the less I actually know. So <laughs> yeah. we share that one. You know, we definitely share that feeling. Um so why would why why would we subject ourselves to a simulation? Because I, I think that we ultimately choose it all. So then you start asking yourself the question, okay, what would be the reasonable thesis? for why mankind would subject themselves to a simulation. Right. So then you start thinking, okay, well, I'm infinite. I'm omnipotent. I'm omniscient. So a simulation that actually leveraged all of my abilities wouldn't be very fun. Hmm. It, it, you, the only way that you could conceive of a game that's going to be interesting and fun is to realize that to play it, you have to limit your abilities. Mm. And it would be no fun at all if you could remember why you created it. The whole thing is to come here to learn through experience. And just like working out requires you to tear muscles at times to make them stronger, breaking your spirit sometimes strengthens it and makes it more resilient. Breaking your heart might actually increase your capacity to love. So what if we created a simulation that was like a simulation of duality, that the way we can learn about concepts like pain or concepts like pleasure or love, all the things we would want to learn, forgiveness, compassion, right. unconditional love, we would have to experience not through didactic classroom setting, but experience in a way that it's experiential because that's going to stick the most. And it also serves another thing. What if that's actually serving the purpose of the overall universe itself, which is to gather all the possible different subjective perspectives to increase mm -hmm. its record of emotional states which emotions are derived from our perception of our reality. And no one will ever see the world like we do as individuals ever again, or has ever seen it that way in the past either. Right. So we're adding unique perspectives of input that then build a larger and larger field of information. So the universe can expand. Let's say one of our, somebody is listening to this. Let's just say for in this case, because our audience, we have a lot of teachers, let's say, I'm a teacher, Robert. Fantastic. This has been very compelling. I agree. We are in a simulation. What can I take away from this, though? Should I leave <laughs> with, with with peace? Like, should I, you, you know, like should, should I leave? Like, me happy? peace out, bitches. Like, right? right? It's like I'm out. Right? Like, sh should I? Sh <laughs> should I be happy after this conversation? Yes. You should be depressed. And why? Here's the beauty of it, because it is actually very beautiful. The purpose we are here, I believe is to learn through opposites. Until we no longer judge those opposites negatively, we have not learned the concept yet. So what do I mean by this? So we've all experienced situations where we've been through very difficult circumstances at some point in time or another. And we've said, oh, that was so bad. I'm going through hell right now. This is terrible. But then how many right. times a year, two years, three years, maybe four or five years down the road, can you look back and say, you know what? It felt like hell at the time, but actually that experience was the best thing that ever happened to me because it led to this. Yep. All the time. So many times. Yep. So really what we're experiencing is just an illusion of the pain because actually all the learning comes through the pain. No pain, no gain. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Does it mean that we should expose to more pain now, to more pain? Well, yeah, look, 
here's the thing, right? I'm, I'm, I was not a mountain climber, but if I were a mountain climber, I wouldn't want to be happy climbing the hill behind my house. I want to push myself to the max. I'm going to go after Mount Everest, even though I know that there's dead frozen bodies that basically populate the side of that mountain at the top near the summit. I'm going to risk it all. And then if I die, I might come back and say, I'll do it next time. Damn it. I'm going to come back. <laughs> it might even change my perspective on how I would like to die. Maybe I'd want to have as many experiences as I possibly could. Hmm. You know, in the beginning, it's like, oh, I want to die making love to the love of my life. That was great for like three times. And then after that, you know, I want to die in a fiery cataclysm, right? In like a James Bondian style freaking explosion. <laughs> It changes our entire perspective. And more importantly, the things that we choose as our challenges in life, our struggles, are not going to be the same as what other people would choose. So why should we judge what other people should want to have chosen? This podcast is sponsored by Argo Prep, an award-winning educational publisher serving over a million students nationwide. If you're a kindergarten to eighth grade teacher or principal, be sure to check out our supplementary workbooks to get your students ready for standardized state testing. We cover all subjects from kindergarten to eighth grade. Use the coupon code AVENUE for a 25% discount off of all purchase orders. Visit us today at argoprep.com slash store. Your, your professional background is incredibly diverse, <laughs> ranging from leading corporations in the medical field to founding your own growth equity holding company. Uh, what inspired you to pursue such a multifaceted career? I think it was just uh, probably something that came out of my interests that were very diverse in general. I, I always rejected this notion of being pigeonholed into one or two areas that were very narrow. And their orientation. I had lots of interests. The reason I didn't go to law school was because even though I was interested in law, I didn't want to only be a lawyer in my lifetime. Mm. Uh, I also loved medicine. And so I thought, well, geez, how can I be, you know, both involved in medicine and healthcare and cutting edge technologies uh, without having to actually be a doctor? And, mm. and so I was able to weave all of these different aspects together. And whenever people would kind of say, okay, you know, let's go specialize more. You should go specialize more and more. I would kind of reject it. And I kind of cut my own path and said, you know, I, I, I'd rather stay and remain broad, which was hard to do. It was very hard to do because we have so much pressure in society, I think, pushing us towards hyper-specialization in general, particularly in academics. And, and so I really kind of had to reject it uh, on its face. And, um, and then decide, you know, and it, it became challenging on many levels because when people ask you what you do, it's hard to just give a simple answer. You know, it's like, oh, I'm right. a, you know, I'm a contractor, a general contractor, or I'm a mathematician, or I'm a scientist or whatever it is that, you know, you, you've chosen your area of expertise to be. In my case, you know, I'm equal parts uh, musician, uh, mathematician, um, artist, uh, geometer. Uh, physicist. I'm like all those different things. And I've been able to, and also an entrepreneur and creator, I've been able to sprinkle different aspects uh, and look at things differently because, especially within specialties, because mm -hmm. of that broad background, I could take mm -hmm. learnings from one area and apply it innovatively to another area that's not, at least on its surface, seemingly connected at all. Mm -hmm. But actually, everything's connected. I think there's a, a big issue going on in society right now where it's almost like we only hear what we want to hear and we're stuck in an echo chamber of our own conditioning biases. And this is in part because of AI, because wow. AI knows what's going to get you the highest dopamine hit. And that's when you go into a chat room where everyone agrees with you. So then you end up at an, at an election time where inevitably half of society is polarized in one direction and half is polarized in the other. And everyone's shocked when their candidate doesn't win. Because how could it be when everybody agrees with me in all my chat rooms on social media, how could it be mm. that there's anyone who disagrees with me? And I think this is what we're dealing with in society right now. We're sort of waking up to this reality of this highly and hyper-polarized 
societal structure that I think is a direct result of hyper-specialization. Because wow. we've lost the ability to empathize and listen and put ourselves in other people's shoes and understand that their perspective, you may not agree with it, that's fine, but you have to at least recognize that there's value to looking at things in different ways. Hmm. So what happens in society is very often the thing that you're trying to fight against. So right. let's say you're fighting in favor of more tolerance from a societal perspective. Okay. And so you're going to push the notion of what tolerance is as far as you possibly can push the envelope on what tolerance is so much so that eventually you become the thing that you're basically intolerant of is, is intolerance. So you actually can get to the imp of the perverse, right? Where you push something all the way to the edge. And this is what I started noticing a lot of the stuff that I thought was opposite in society, like communism and fascism, looking at different governance models. And then right. I started thinking to myself, well, can I even think of one example where a communist regime that was billed as a communist regime didn't actually become a fascist totalitarian state? And I couldn't wow. think of even one example, not even wow. one. So this is where you start to realize the things that you're fighting for, very often, you can end up becoming the opposite of that thing without even realizing that it happened. What does an anarchy government system look like, possibly? Well, I think that we're on the precipice of a period of time where we could contemplate this, which I guess in a way is good news. The reason why we could contemplate it, <laughs> well, it's probably bad news that we're even willing to contemplate it because <laughs> it's like that tells you how screwed up things are, right? right it must be right. really jacked for us to be thinking about, well, what about no government as a model? Hmm. Well... I think that one of the things that I really like about blockchain technology and the, the purpose right. that I saw in blockchain right from the very beginning was a potential for a new governance because blockchain already in, inhabits within that a new type of governance with its node validation system. Okay. So one of the problems we have in society is how do we nail down an objective truth? Is there such a thing as an objective truth? That's a tough question. It sounds easy, especially for educators. In point of fact, is it really easy, though? So if there are 30 people that are eyewitnesses to a shooting, how many different reports are we going to get that are going to be likely very, very different from every other report? 30. And this happens all the time. One of my closest friends is the, was the founder and CEO of Discovery, which is a, a group that does mock juries. And so they have to deal with this issue all the time, that people mm -hmm. don't see the world as it necessarily is. They see the world as right. they are. Right, right. So I think one of the most important things is to teach our youth to start seeing the world from outside of their own shoes. How do we teach kids or youth to question everything? Because I think this is the base to question everything if, it's, if it has other sides of the opinion. I think one of the ways that it's so critical to teach youth is going to be modeling example. Okay. So the best way to teach, you know, it's like this in my companies, I have this thing where I say, you know, no menial task is beneath any one of us. Okay. So if I walk out in the main area and I find like a bubblegum wrapper on the floor, I could say to somebody else, Hey, pick this up, right? Please pick it up. But that wouldn't actually be as effective as me just picking it up myself. 100%. And why do you think that is? Why is CEO, that? CEO, that's... Yeah. You, you're, you're modeling. You're doing the modeling. Yeah. Without saying a single word, I've just told everybody else yeah. what's important to me. It's important to me to maintain a clean office environment. Yep. And be organized. If I walk by again and there's a bubblegum wrapper that's there and the person that was sitting closest to it didn't pick it up but had seen it, then they're feeling like, uh-oh, I probably should have been the one to pick that up. <laughs> yeah. So modeling example is the most powerful tool for learning. And if we are sitting here trying to tell people that we want to foster and create an environment where people can challenge narratives, then we have to be willing to take those challenges. We have to be willing to get offended. 
And in today's society, everyone gets so easily offended over everything. And here's the truth. If you get offended by people, what they say and what they do, you have to ask yourself for a moment, is it you that's the problem? Maybe you're perceiving it in a way. Now, clearly, there's going to be cases where maybe what was said was offensive. But in society, for society to work and function correctly, you cannot suppress every part of communication in society. You will kill the ability to challenge narrative. And this, and this is, exactly is what's what we're happening with right council now. culture. Council yep. culture right now. Now, look, I'm, yep. not, I'm not conservative. I'm not Republican. I'm not Democrat. I'm... Start. I'm very, very, very much a indep independent because I don't vote based on party. I vote based on policy. I vote based on candidate. And I think what's happened is we get so stuck in the same notion of scientism and it could be dogmaism, right? It's any kind of dogma, mm. right? Where the established narrative cannot be challenged. I agree. I agree with you hundred percent. It is being increasingly difficult to challenge a narrative because if you challenge it you're an outcast to oh society. you get canceled you get canceled you get kicked time. off of social media yeah right. i mean it is what it is yeah i mean <laughs> it is but that is very harmful to us as a society overall oh and we wonder why suicide rates are so high i mean it was hard enough being in high school with just like all the petty stuff that happens in high school mm. Now expand that and multiply it exponentially. And then you've got something we call this social media experiment that we just all assumed that we could adopt and no problem. And yeah. now add on top of that AI and algorithms that are basically cattle prodding people into different conditioning bias chambers. Yep. Thus decreasing their ability to empathize with others and making Thanksgiving dinner a, a, hell, a hell night. And how is it different with, <laughs> with, with other cultures, with other governments, U.S., let's say, and England or Asia? I think any dogma that doesn't allow open discussion and free debate is, is going to become a culture cancellation dogma. I think mm -hmm. it's going to become a culture war. It reminds me of Mao Zedong in, you know, the, the 40s and 50s and the Cultural Revolution, right? And, you know, or Stalin. You know, 100 million people were killed. A lot of people that sit here and say to me, oh, I think communism's the answer. It never got a real shot. I'm like, dude, go back and look at the entire 20th century. What are you talking about? I'm not a huge fan of our current government system. I'd rather, you know, I'm more libertarian, I guess, in that sense. And I probably would say, hey, well, let's try the one we haven't tried yet. No government. How's that? Because I don't get anything for it. And I pay for it. And all right. I get is kind of, agitation and grief and then everything is a game it's kind of like you know the fall of rome where it's like the emperor comes out and says oh we're going to issue games you know for everyone and we'll give them bread and wine at the games it's like the craziest stuff ever right now